open our Bibles to Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9. Last week, as we continued our series on transformed, we looked once again at the power that an individual can make in someone's heart and life in the transformation process that the Lord wants to do. And we looked at a couple of individuals. First of all, we looked at Ananias, who the Lord told him in Acts chapter number 9 that I want you to go and to a certain man's house and there's a guy I want you to see there. And oh yeah, his name is Saul of Tarsus. He's the one who has come here to kill you and to persecute you, to get you to blaspheme the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus that I want you to go see. And of course, Ananias does what we often do, maybe when we don't hear quite correctly. You know, maybe your wife's going to ask you a question or so on and so forth, and you want to make sure that that's exactly what she meant or what they meant. Lord, are, what, are you sure? Because I, I know and have heard who this Saul of Tarsus is. And the Lord said, I want you to go. Because I see him not for who he is right now or what he has been. I see him for who I'm going to make him to be. And we need to see people in, through the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. See them for the potential that they can become. So often we're so hard on people. Uh, because they're not necessarily where we want them to be or quickly, as quickly as we'd like them to be. It's the Lord's job to change them. We need to see them for the potential. I stop and think about these boys and girls that have sung for us here this morning and what a wonderful job that they did. But when I, you know, I, I almost came to tears just looking at them, stopping to think about who it is that they may become. And what God may be able to do if they will surrender their lives to Him. So much potential. And the potential is in every single one of us. If we give our heart and life to the Lord to do what He wants us to do. And we need to see people for that potential. And you may be the one that God uses to change the direction of somebody's life. To change their course. So let's not be so quick to judge. But let's try to encourage Try to strengthen them. So Ananias goes and he's obedient and uh, does what the Lord tells him to do. And then we looked, of course, at Barnabas. And, it, you know, the Apostle Paul finally makes his way in up to Jerusalem. He wants to get together with the disciples that are there. And they said, no, we know who you are. We're not going to fall for that trick where you pretend to be one of us and so you can figure out exactly who's who and come after us. But Barnabas, he stood up for Saul. Kind of took him under his wing and said, Hey, I, you know, I've seen it. I've heard about what has happened. There's been a change in his heart and his life. And, he, and Barnabas put himself out there for, the, for Saul and made an impact. And we are to be that one. And we will continue to look here. And I want to begin reading in verse number 18. It says, And immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ." And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying wait was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. 
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you don't just leave us where you found us. But Lord, you take us and you mold us and you change and you transform us into the person that you desire us to be. And I'm so thankful through the power of the Holy Ghost and the grace of God that I am not who I used to be. Lord, I know that there is a lot of work that still needs to be done in my heart and in my life, but I thank you for what you have done so far. Now, I pray that you would continue that transformation process in my heart and life. Lord, I pray that for all who are here today, that you would take and use and change each one of us, that we might go forth as the Christian you want us to be. And I pray that you would continue to show us that transformation work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in Acts chapter number 9, we see the work that was done. You remember that as that light shone down from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ confronted Saul. He was blinded. And, uh, of course, that's when he, God told Ananias, I want you to go and touch his eyes that he might see. And in verse number 18, we find him obedient to do that. And he's able to see again. He follows the Lord in baptism, makes that very first step of obedience. Once again, that's not for salvation, but identification. And he kind of receives some food and gains some strength. Remember, it had been three days that he didn't eat or drink anything. Gains his strength and is there with those believers for some certain days and preaches the Lord Jesus Christ and of course they're amazed already the fact that here is this person who wants to kill Christians who wants to persecute the church now he's preaching in this very name and verse 22 tells us Saul increased the more in strength and uh, we wouldn't know it just from reading Acts chapter number 9 that there is a certain amount of time that takes place between these two verses as we begin to study scripture, we see some of the things that take place. And that's what I want to talk about here this morning. Turn over to Galatians chapter number 1. There's a certain amount of time in between these two verses. And it's what I want to focus in on, on this section of the transforming process. And that is the fact that there was some learning that needed to be done. Some training. That the Apostle Paul didn't just accept Christ as a Savior and then go off and begin to preach and teach and all these different things all around the world. He had to receive some instruction. He had to unlearn some of the things that he had learned and he had to learn what the truth was. And in Galatians chapter number 1, as the Apostle Paul is writing to this church in Galatia, he kind of gives us, fills in some of the information that we don't get in the book of Acts. Look at verse number 11. He says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia." And returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. And then he goes on to talk about some of the other things. But what, what he's, the statement he's trying to make is, that, listen, this thing that I'm preaching to you, Church of Galatia, is, is not something I learned from men. This is not some man that just dreamed this up and I'm telling you. He says there was a learning process. I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. He was baptized as we see in Acts chapter number 9. But there in between those two verses 
in Acts 20, 9, 21 and 9, 22, there's some learning that's done. There's some study that happens. That he says, I went off into Arabia, which was a big, large section there. It doesn't tell us how long he was there. Some people take it out of context and, and kind of misread some of this stuff to say that he was there for three years. He was in Damascus for three years. But when he went into Arabia for some teaching and some learning and some instruction from Jesus Christ himself, and that's what he tells us in verse number 12, I wasn't taught it by men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. There was some learning there. How it happened, we're not exactly sure. But he tells us it was the Lord Jesus Christ who taught and showed him that, uh, the things that he needed to know. Uh, stop and think just as the other apostles. You think about the other disciples and where they were when the Lord found them, all from different places and had uh, different backgrounds, different professions. We looked uh, earlier in the year, uh, last year, about, you know, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And uh, they were rough men. And the Lord called, you think about Peter, one of the most well-known, and who he was. And just the transformation that took place because he'd spent time with the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw all the miracles that were done. He heard all the teachings, the Sermon on the Mount and everything else. Has spent some time alone just with the Lord Jesus Christ and received that instruction. And Peter changed because he'd spent time with the Lord. Learning, receiving that instruction. Yes, he made mistakes. Yes, he learned some lessons the hard way, but the Lord continued to work through him, continued to teach him and show him. And there's some times in our lives where we're a lot like Peter. We, we've got to learn the lesson the hard way sometimes. And uh, it's not fun to learn that way. But some of us, like me, we've, we've seem to learn better that way. Learn the hard way, what not to do or what we ought to do. And you stop and think about just the fact of Peter denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times. We don't ever find the Lord getting angry with Peter. We don't ever find him really scolding him and rebuking him because he made that mistake. And it shows the real difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and us a lot of times. Because when Jesus Christ came across sinners, he loved them. He was soft with them, try to encourage them to do what was right and to turn from their sin, which is exactly the opposite of who we are a lot of times. We come across somebody who, that we deem a sinner or they've fallen or they made a mistake and we pound on them and we crush them and we step on them and we kick them while they're down a lot of times and that's not the attitude the Lord Jesus Christ had. Peter made mistakes and what did the Lord do? We see in John chapter number 21, he made a little breakfast for him, a little meal for him, sat down, and had some questions for him. He wanted him to stop and to think about the choices that he made in his life and really question if he was going to love the Lord more than anybody else. And uh, Peter's life has changed. Now he's preaching and 3,000 people get saved at one time. He's doing a great work. But see, that came because he spent time with the Lord Jesus. And the same is true for Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. Here he goes into Arabia, and many believe that he went down to Mount Sinai, much like Elijah did, where the Lord spent some time with Elijah and then instructed him to go to Damascus. And we find that same thing here with the Apostle Paul. He goes into Arabia. We're not sure where. There's a lot of speculation, as I said before. But he spent some time receiving instruction in the Lord. And that's what we're supposed to do. We looked last week at Matthew chapter number 28, that great commission that tells us that we are to teach all nations. We're to teach them how to be saved. We're to make sure that they take that first step of baptism. And we looked at Saul and how he took that first step. He identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. In baptism. But it continues on from there and it says, Teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. 
We come to know Christ as our Savior. We are to receive instruction from His Word. We're to become students of the Bible. 2 Timothy tells us we are to study the Word of God. That we are to become students of this book to know what it is that the Lord wants us to do. As I gave an illustration this morning in our Sunday school class about a time when I worked at Walmart. And I was the cart pusher who was outside and bring, making sure everybody's got their carts. And I, I love doing that. I was outside, away from people, and I could just do my job. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed doing it. But there were certain times that they would call me into the store to do different things. Whether it was load somebody's car or this one particular Christmas, they needed me to help them in layaway. And to scan the packages and make sure that they've got people's packages, they're in the right place, and so on and so forth. And they give you what's called a tells on a little computer that scans and does different things. Handed me this computer I'd not seen before and said, we want you to inventory the layaway. I hadn't received instruction on this piece of equipment. I didn't know what to do. And so it was very frustrating. It was, that was a difficult day because I hadn't received the instruction. I hadn't had the time where I was taught what to do with this thing so I could go and do the job and do it properly. And we as Christians are to become students of this book. A couple of weeks, we're going to start a series called Eat This Book looking at the importance of studying the Word of God, of knowing what it says. We are to be lifetime students of the Word of God. So often we look to some person, whether it's the pastor or a teacher or some person, to teach us and instruct us, and those are good things. We ought to have a time where we sit down and are taught. Even as a pastor, there are certain people that I go to on a, more than once a week and I'll sit and I'll listen, whether online or whatever, and I'll listen to the teaching that they have and try to learn. And, and we need to do that. It's good to have someone instruct us uh, in the things of the Lord that we might learn. But that's not to be our sole source of instruction and learning. The Bible tells us that you are to study. You are to know the Word of God for yourself. You're to take time to get into this book and receive that instruction. Saul spent some time. He went off into the desert and he learned from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord showed him a lot of things. You read uh, his epistles, his letters to the churches, all the different things that he pours out that the Lord taught him. All the mysteries and different things that weren't totally understood in the Old Testament. Jesus revealed those things to him. He might do the task that God had called him to do. He had to receive that instruction. And you and I are to be students of the Word of God. The Bible tells us we are to be ready to give an answer at all times for the hope that is within us. We can't do that if we don't know the book. He tells us where to study. Turn over to John chapter number 14. You say, well... You know, I don't, I don't know a whole lot. Maybe you got saved, you didn't grow up in church and Sunday school and have a, somebody like Maurice in junior church who could teach you and kind of show you some of the stories and the different things and the lessons. But that doesn't matter. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, we are given a gift, a person, the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus, as he's instructing his disciples in John chapter number 14, he's letting them know that, very shortly, I'm going to leave you, but not to worry too much, because he is going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 26 of John chapter number 14. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so he, Jesus told his disciples, listen, you don't have to worry that I'm going to be leaving you. Because when I leave, the Heavenly Father is going to send someone else. He's going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. 
one of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do is he's going to teach you all things. He's going to instruct you. We turn over just a page or two. John chapter number 16. Same discourse here, just a little further down. We get to verse number 13. It says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, that's once again the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. But you notice that phrase there. It tells us that he will guide you into all truth. One of the wonderful things that if we want to know the truth, God says, I'll reveal it to you. I'll show you. If you want to know what's in this book, I'll reveal it. It's what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. One of the promises that he gives, he says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, that you really want to know the truth, you want to receive that instruction. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, then you will be filled every single time when the Word of God is open, whether you're in the quietness of your own bedroom and you're opening it up to receive instruction, whether we're in, gathered together like we are this morning in a public setting. When the Word of God is open, wherever it is, we can learn. We can receive instruction, not necessarily because the person up there is speaking or whoever it might be is such a great teacher and has so much intellect and this and that. But because if you know Christ as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit within you, Amen. that he will teach you, that he will guide you in all truth. One of the wonderful things about the, the Spirit of God and of his word. As the word of God goes forth, whether it's me studying it myself or someone else is proclaiming it, the spirit of God empowers it and reveals it to our hearts and lives. If I'm standing up here speaking and preaching the truth of the word of God and you receive something from it, it's not because of me. It's not because I'm some great person and some great speaker and this and that. I have such great knowledge. No, if you get anything at all, it's because the spirit of God has guided you to that truth. It's because He is the one that has taught you. And so we are to be the students of this book. And here in Galatians, as the Apostle Paul is, is speaking, and he's kind of given his testimony. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. He says, man, I really persecuted the church. That I went after them and uh, tried to destroy them. And uh, he says in verse number 13, that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. The idea of to pillage it and destroy it. And he was, verse 14, more exceedingly zealous. And we looked in Acts chapter number 26, that he had a zeal to persecute the church, to destroy it. But you notice in verse number 15, something so wonderful. But when it pleased God, you kind of skip over that parenthesis there. To get to verse number 16, it pleased God to reveal his son in me. That there was a certain time, there was a certain day where God did that transforming work, called out to him. That light shone down from heaven in Acts chapter number 9. It pleased God to do that. Think about his wonderful love that he has for us. He commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then he tells us that he did not go up to Jerusalem in verse number 17. But I went unto Arabia. You see, there was that learning process where in verse number uh, 12, he says, I was taught by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I received that instruction. Then after whatever that time was, it doesn't tell us how long. We don't know how long he was in Arabia. But then he's instructed to go back to Damascus. And so he goes there. And it tells us that 
uh, for three years. He returned to Damascus, look at verse number 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. And so for three years, he's in Damascus there, and in Acts chapter number 9, uh, it tells us that uh, in verse number 22, but Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. He received the instruction. He received the learning. And then he began to do what it is that the Lord called him to do. There, even, in, even in the calling that God had for him. He kind of put it to practice. You know, I stop and think about the wonderful work that the Lord Jesus Christ did in my heart and my life when on that gym floor in Wisconsin, he called out to me spiritually, shined that light down from heaven and confronted me. And I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. That was on a Thursday night. The next Sunday, as Pastor Plinus was preaching, I don't, I don't remember what he's preaching on. But I remember when it came time for the invitation, the Holy Spirit of God was speaking to my heart. And he said, I want you to be a preacher. I want you to proclaim the truth that's found in this book. I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. If that's what you want me to do, then I'm going to do it. Now, there was a lot I didn't understand back then when I said, I'll do it. <laughs> I didn't understand, first of all, that I would have to stand in front of people and proclaim the truth. That didn't come into my mind at that time which I'm, I'm not necessarily fond of doing that. Uh, you've got to work with a lot of people, and I'm not necessarily the greatest people person in the world. And so there was a lot of things that I didn't know when I said, I'll do it. But I remember that time when I surrendered. I said, Lord, I, I know this is what you want me to do, and I will do it. And I had a wonderful pastor who took me under his wing and began to kind of instruct me and, you know, if, if this is really what you're going to do and you feel God has called you to do it, then he will strengthen, he'll empower you. And, and of course, you know, Pastor Plinus began to give me opportunities to do what the Lord had called me to do. And I'll never forget, we were having a youth gather, get together, and uh, Pastor Plinus and, and, uh, said, you know, I want you to give a devotion. And I, I got up there, and I bet in three minutes, you know, I had read three chapters of the Bible and <laughs> expounded everything I knew on it, which wasn't a whole lot, and uh, still learning more every single day. But, but there was, even in that, there was a lot of training. And when I was down at Pensacola Christian College, I had the opportunity to uh, intern at a church in, in Foley, Alabama, Open Door Baptist Church, under Pastor Eddie Wallace, and uh, took me under his wing and gave me an opportunity uh, to work in the youth ministry, to teach Sunday school, gave me an opportunity to preach uh, from his pulpit, and uh, just all the different training and the different learning. And here for three years in Damascus, the Apostle Paul continues that learning and that training and that's what we're to do. That's a part of that transformation process is learning the things that the Lord wants us to learn. You're never going to change. You're never going to be transformed if you don't get into the Word of God and study it. You can't become what He wants you to become if you don't know what He wants you to become. It's the Word of God that reveals to us that there's things in our lives that shouldn't be there. And we got to get rid of them. It's the Word of God that shows us, hey, you need these things in your life. And without that instruction and knowing what I need, I can't, I can't get it. I can't do it. we got to have that instruction. Saul spent some time training learning what it is that the Lord wanted him to learn. And if we're ever going to change, if we're ever going to go from 
who we are now into what he wants us to be. We've got to study this book. We've got to learn what it says. We ought to strive to know everything that's in here. We ought to strive to know everything he wants us to do. Everything he wants us to be. It's all right here. We don't need some light to shine down from heaven and to speak to us. It's right here in front of us. We can hold it in our hands. We can read it with our own eyes. I don't need some person to tell me what the Lord says. It's right here. We've got to study it. We've got to learn it, know it for ourselves. And so in this transformation process, one of the big parts in it is taking some time to study this book, to know it. Not to just take somebody's word for it that that's what the Bible says, but to study it for ourselves, to know the truth. I encourage you to bring your Bible with you to church. You ought to have it with you. You ought to follow along. You ought to make sure that what's being said is true according to this book. Not just because the pastor said it or someone else said it, but because you study it and you know it. If God's ever going to transform your life, if he's ever going to transform my life, it's because we've taken time to study this book.